The talk today is called Mary Ward's Institute, The Journey. And I have the lovely tapestry picture there with Mary Ward, in my imagination, is standing in England and looking towards Europe and Rome. However, I'd like to say from the beginning that this is not the story of the provinces. This is the story of all the different independent parts of Mary Ward's Institute and their journey. When Mary Ward died, there were four communities of the Institute that we know of. The main one was in Munich. There was a community in Yorkshire with Mary when she died. There was a small community in London. And there was also a small community in Rome. And you'll see the plaque in the English College there mentioning Barbara Ward, Elizabeth Cotton, Barbara Babthorpe and Catherine Dawson who were buried in the English College in Rome. And a photo of Mary's tombstone where she's buried in Yorkshire. What Mary Ward wanted for her institute was that it was one and not separate parts independent of each other, with one superior general, free from the jurisdiction of the diocesan bishop, free from the obligations of cloister, focused on mission and flexible to respond to the needs. So this was a very radical request at the time and it led of course as we know to the suppression of the institute. Nevertheless these communities survived. The community in Munich continued and the chief superior or that was what they called the superior general in those days lived there and in 1653 Mary Points became the chief superior and she received an invitation from the people of Augsburg, a nearby city, to found a house of the institute and a school there for the people of the town. The initiative to found the school in Augsburg was a very fruitful one. There had been very little growth in the Munich community, but once the Augsburg house opened, the house flourished and many women joined the institute and many other houses and schools were founded. Francis Beddingfield is another really important member of the institute in this story. She entered the institute in 1630, just before the suppression. Shortly after Mary Ward's death, the community in Yorkshire moved to Paris and in 1669, Frances Beddingfield returned from Paris to England. The community she brought with her moved several times between Yorkshire and London until she finally established the Bar Convent in 1686. And the Bar Convent in York is a very important point in this story. During the 18th century, the Institute expanded considerably in Central Europe particularly in Austria and in southern Germany. Although the picture of Europe at that time was very different from what we know of it today. On the map of Europe of that time, the Austrian monarchy in green was an enormous reality, comprised nearly all of what we know now as Eastern Europe. And below it, the Ottoman Empire in Mauve is much further extended into Europe than we know today. The Papal States was an important force in central Italy. The Kingdom of Venice was also a very strong maritime power and the electorate of Bavaria quite prominent on that map. During this time of the expansion of the Institute, the different Institute superiors in each place, although they understood themselves to belong to a single Institute, were under a lot of different local pressures. They wanted to keep the spirit of the Institute and the spirit of Mary Ward, but the local bishop might have had very different ideas. The local ruler would have had rules about who could enter an Institute, who could be the superior, what work they did. The state government could also weigh in with different laws about religious institutes and their work. And then we have the Holy See, the Pope, who was making laws also about religious life. So institute superiors had to navigate through this maze to survive as best they could. 
And that situation lasted until 1917, when a new innovation came from Rome, which was the Code of Canon Law, which finally gave direction about the sort of institute that Mary Ward wanted to found, which by then had become much more the norm. During the 1700s also, there was a real movement towards secularization, an anti-religious movement, which was led by big scientific discoveries, much more general education and technological advances. There was also complications about European politics and its relationship to the church and to the very strong religious orders that existed at that time, in particular the Jesuits. And there was a real reaction against what was seen as the political interference of the Jesuits in secular matters. The Jesuits were suppressed by the papacy in 1773. And in Germany, many of the houses were closed by the government. The Paradiser House in Munich, where the chief superior lived, was closed in 1809. And shortly after that, the chief superior died and was not replaced. Other houses in Germany were closed at that time too. Fortunately, Augsburg remained open because the local people insisted that it remain. And the house in Austria, St. Pilton, was allowed to remain open on condition that it had its own superior and was not subject to the superior in Bavaria. And the house in Mainz, in southwestern Germany, again was separated from Bavaria for political reasons. So we have three independent groups appearing. The period of secularization didn't last long. After the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars, religious institutes, houses and ministries gradually reopened. The Society of Jesus was restored in 1814 and the community in Munich were restored also. However, the Paradiser House had been taken by the government and used for other purposes. So the government actually gave the institute a wing of the Nymphenburg Royal Summer Palace and a new superior general was actually appointed by Rome. So the institute was restored completely in that sense by 1835. At the same time, things were happening in York. The superior of the Bar Convent finished her term and there was an election in the house. The superior there was elected and needed the confirmation of the superior general in Bavaria, but she was no longer alive and there was no one to turn to. So the local bishop insisted that the York House go under his jurisdiction and become separate from Germany. At the same time in Ireland there were great developments. The rights of Catholics were slowly being restored after centuries of suppression. Catholics weren't able to own businesses, weren't able to own land, weren't able to have an education and gradually laws came into place which restored these rights and in 1814, the coadjutor Archbishop Murray of Dublin asked the community in York to found a house in Dublin that would be a school like the school in York. At the same time, this Archbishop Murray also founded the Sisters of Mercy and the Sisters of Charity so that the works of mercy and charity could take place as well as the works of education. There was a real restoration of the church going on in Ireland at that time. Mrs. Coyney, the superior there, wrote to the archbishop and said, I have consulted our bishop and he agrees to our receiving Miss Ball as a member of our Holy Institute with a view to our training her to be the foundress of a house of the same order in Dublin. So the York community wasn't able to send sisters certainly wasn't able to send financial support, but agreed to train a new member to make that foundation. Frances Ball had been a student at the school in York, and she agreed to the Archbishop's request. She went back to York 
made her novitiate and was professed there in 1816. She founded the first house of the Institute in Ireland in 1822. She was actually seven years in the York community. But like the Bar Convent, the Irish Foundation was placed under the jurisdiction of the local bishop. The Foundation in Ireland was an immediate success and many young women joined the community, so much so that Teresa Ball had to found new houses in order to find spaces for these new entrants. And in 1833, she got an invitation from Navin in the Diocese of Meath to found a school there. Frances Ball agreed to that request and sent a small community of sisters to Meath. However, there must have been some misunderstanding right from the beginning. There were difficulties about money, there were difficulties about who was in charge. There was no further interaction between the two groups and Navin became an independent foundation subject to the Bishop of Meath. There were three houses that Teresa Ball founded in Ireland that became independent in this way. The first was Navin, then Fermoy and Omer. Four others remained attached to Rathfarnham. The canon law at that time was very vague about these relationships, so mostly they were just agreements between the local bishops and the institute. Teresa Ball also sent sisters beyond Ireland in a big move in a missionary direction. There was an invitation to send sisters to Canada, which took place in 1847, a very difficult foundation indeed, as we know from the story of the Toronto Foundation. It was under the jurisdiction of the Archbishop of Toronto in 1880. So for 33 years, it remained connected to Rathfarnham. All the other overseas foundations from Rathfarnham remained attached to Rathfarnham. India, Gibraltar, Mauritius, England, and a community in Spain, which only lasted for a few years and had to be withdrawn for political reasons. After the turbulence of the French Revolution, the Napoleonic Wars, and many other difficulties of a political nature in Europe at the first half of the 19th century, there were big developments in transport technologies, especially in steamships and steam trains. And the growing stability of Europe enabled many Institute members to travel across Europe in the second half of the 19th century. And these sisters were very anxious to make connections between the different parts of the Institute. They wrote letters home describing all the different things that they found in the various convents. They shared their own history, learnt about the history of the other houses, and they also talked a lot about Mary Ward herself. The story that I'm going to tell you now is a real illustration of how there were many people who made a real impact on the development of the Institute at this time. And the two people involved are called Marianna and Petronilla. This starts with Marianna Finn. Marianna was an Irish woman who joined the Rathfarnham community very early in its history. And she was sent by Teresa Ball as one of the first community members when the Navin House was opened. With the difficulties between the two communities of Rathfarnham and Navin, Marianna, who was by then Mother Paul Finn, was appointed by the bishop as the superior for life. In other words, accrediting her with being the founding superior of that small branch of the Institute. And in 1846, she found a doctor who recommended that for her health she should take a sea voyage. And she went to Augsburg in Germany to investigate the Institute because she felt the lack of connections now that the bond between Navin and Rathfarnham had been broken. In Augsburg, she found Petronilla Barrett. Petronilla was an Irish woman like Marianna. Petronilla was a convert and she had gone to Germany to teach English in the school at Augsburg. And there she joined the Institute and she was Mother Ignatius Barrett. They two became friends. 
So in 1852, Petronella was granted permission to return to Ireland to the Navan community. Now this is quite an extraordinary thing because these two communities were completely separate institutes at that time. And from there, she was appointed the superior of a new house at Belbriggan in 1857 and Petronella Barrett was made the superior of that house. However, with the demands for more clarity about the jurisdiction of the superior generals and the bishops, there was a question about Mother Teresa Bull's jurisdiction over the house at Belbriggan. And in 1861, the Vatican made the decision that Belbriggan was under the jurisdiction of Rathfarnham. Of course, Mother Ignatius Barrett was not a bit pleased about this because she came from the Navan group. And she immediately took up her bags, took with her a few members of the community and novices, and went to Germany and arrived at the Superior General at Nymphenburg, who found on her doorstep three or four Irish women of the Institute, but not of her Institute. And she sent them to England to found a new house of the Institute in the south of England in Gloucester. And it was from that house that the other houses in the south of England were founded and thrived. So we have extraordinary journeys here which resulted in Rathfarnham actually being effective in founding a house of the Institute in England, which is quite an extraordinary story. From those houses in the south of England, we have another amazing story of Mother Catherine Chambers. Catherine Chambers was actually an Anglican sister and the community that she belonged to ran a printing business in England during the time of Cardinal Newman when a great deal of religious literature was being published. And Catherine Chambers read herself into the Catholic Church. She of course had to leave her sisterhood and she asked to join the Institute. The superior in London at the time welcomed her gladly and before she was even out of the novitiate she took Catherine Chambers to Europe with her skills in writing and publishing and history. They scoured the archives in all the houses and in Rome and came back with an enormous amount of material and Catherine herself wrote The Life of Mary Ward in two volumes. The first volume was published in 1882, the second in 1885. And in 1885, Catherine Chambers died. She'd been a member of the Institute for only 10 years and all that time had been devoted to this wonderful work. The publication of Mary Ward's life was a sensation because the only lives of Mary Ward had been written before the Institute was told that it could not recognise Mary as their foundress and they couldn't be published. So this was the first time that even Institute members knew something of the life of Mary Ward. It energised the whole Institute and gave impetus to efforts to petition the Vatican for official recognition of the Institute, for the union of the Institute, for the acknowledgement of Mary Ward as the foundress, and Mary Ward's canonization. Building on the knowledge of Mary Ward from the Catherine Chambers book, the Institute members started writing much more to each other and becoming much more interested in these movements towards unity. And in 1900, Mother Gonzaga Barry from Australia was effective in organizing an Institute-wide meeting in Rome. And one of the roles of that meeting was to write a joint constitution for all the different branches of the Institute. At that time, Pope Leo XIII was encouraging congregations with the same origins to unite into international pontifical right institutes, exactly what Mary Ward had asked for in her day. So this was a movement encouraged by the church. We know that that meeting wasn't successful for political reasons. But following that, there were a number of what we would call reunions among the Institute's parts. 
and gradually over the 20th century, many of the Institute branches joined together. The first one was in York. They asked to join back to Nymphenburg and that happened in 1911. And then two small independent houses in the north of Italy joined the Austrian branch because as you know the north of Italy was part of Austria at that time. Nymphenburg, Mainz and St Polten started working together and they first decided to have a common constitution. Earlier in the century they invited the Canadian branch and the Irish branch to join them. These invitations weren't accepted at the time so this reunion of the German-speaking branches was put on hold and took place in 1953 in Rome. On the Irish side, the independent groups in Ireland, Omagh in 1934, Navan in 1969 and Fermoy in 1987, returned to Rathfarnham. So we have a map of the Institute in the 20th century which shows that there were no new independent groups but many reunions. And the main story is that at the beginning of the 20th century there were 11 separate groups and at the end of the 20th century there were three. The movement for reunion was a very personal thing built on relationships and here we show the first meeting of the three superior generals of the main groups, which was held in Rome in 1983. On the left is Frederica Boyle from the North American branch. In the middle is Mother Immolata Wetter from the Roman branch. And on the right is Sister Agnes Walsh from the Loretto branch. And in the 1970s, about 1975, the Loreto branch moved their generalate from Rathfarnham to Rome. In the 21st century, there was also a reunion. In 1998, at the Irish branch congregation, the North American Superior General invited the Irish branch to consider a reunion. That invitation was accepted by the Irish branch, and in the year 2000, a committee was established to guide this discernment. In 2002, the North American branch membership voted for reunion and in the same year, a celebration was held called the Feast of Mind and Heart and that took place in the United States and members from all the Irish branch provinces were invited. It was a wonderful celebration. The following year, the actual reunion took place on September the 16th in Toronto that date was the date of the foundation of the North American branch in Toronto so many years before. As part of the agreement about reunion, the North American branch and the Irish branch agreed to write the new modern part of the constitutions in the North American style, as well as reinvestigating taking the full Jesuit constitutions. So a constitutions commission began in 2004 and in 2009, which was the year of our fourth centenary, an extraordinary congregation was held in Rome to vote in the new constitutions, volume one and two, for the reunited Loreto branch. Here we have a picture of the celebration. I'm on the right-hand side, and on the left-hand side is Sister Maria Beera, and at that time, she was the Superior General of the North American branch. At the reunion, Maria joined our council as a councillor in Rome and really made a wonderful contribution to the work of the Institute at that time. And in between us is Francis Orchard, who is the Vicar General of the Roman branch, now the Congregatio Jesu, who joined us for the celebrations. And here we have the celebration of the signing of the decree of reunion. And the journey continues with Sister Jane Livesey, the Superior General of the Congregatio Jesu, and Sister Noelle Corscadden, the Superior General of the Irish branch. They took together a little pilgrimage around Ireland and in particular acknowledged Jane's three great aunts who were members of the Irish Institute. And so the journey continues.